Hello YouTube. This video is in response to uh, a couple of comments that were left on one of my videos about restoring this uh, 1912 Westinghouse table fan. Um, yeah, had a couple of questions about how to remove the covers and rewire the switch and I believe remove the blades amongst a few other things so I'll make a quick crude video here without a whole lot of editing in it and try to cover those parts enough to uh, get him going in the right path so let's jump into it workbench is a little messy here with the uh, tube radio parts and tractor generator rebuilds for Farmall Cub but I just wanted to show a little before and after for as far as polishing here this is radio parts the parts in my hand here this has been polished and you can see the part over here that has not been and you can see the difference of, of what you can do with a little bit of time on a buffing machine. Now the buffing machine I have is just it's just from Harbor Freight. It's not anything fancy. I believe it ran me around 40 bucks or so, but it's it's done the trick. It's got a stitched wheel for heavy buffing and for to remove light uh, scratches. It's got an open non-stitched buffing pad on this side. If we go back over here, um, as far as removing the blades, uh, you want to take the cage off first, and you will find hardware up in the corners. Let's see if we can get it to focus here. Maybe, maybe not. There it is. There's a screw and a little bracket that it threads into. You take all four of those off. There's one in each corner. And then if you come behind in the blades, you look in the back side of the blades, and you'll find a set screw. Let's see if I can zoom in on it right down there on the neck of the blades. Loosen that set screw and the blade should slide off. Um, occasionally they can get stuck on but I've never really had that happen. If that's the case a little gentle persuasion can help or maybe a little WD-40. If you can get a little WD-40 back in here let it soak in to eat away at any corrosion or PB blaster too works well. And the furnace is kicking on so it's going to get a little loud so I'll come back in a few minutes. Now assuming that you already have the blade and cage removed, if you want to get the motor apart, what you need to do is take off these four nuts. There's one here, there's one here, and there's two on the bottom side. And you have the same deal on the back. There's four of these. So you take those off, two at the top, two at the bottom. Your front motor cover will come off. You can see a seam here. And this back piece is all stamped together. This is one large piece. There's not a seam here where it splits. So once you get those nuts off, there should be a stud that'll pull out. You can take the front cover off. And at that point, you should be able to pull your armature out of the motor. Once your armature is out of the motor, you can begin taking the oscillator off to do so. If you look in the bottom side of the oscillator, hopefully you can see it. But there are two screws that hold this cover on. Take those out and remove that cover. And then you can remove the screw that holds on the arm that bolts to the neck that actually makes the fan rotate left and right when the oscillator is engaged. So at that point, you can then take a screwdriver and reach in all the way through the motor and take off these screws that, go th that are only accessible from the inside of the motor. I think you can see the little brass hardware sticking out the back side. And if I remember correctly, there are Yeah, there are four of those as well. And you can indeed take your oscillator apart too. It just simply unthreads. When you get it loose, you can pull it straight out. You can see all of your oil passages and teeth cut in that. Same deal for the back side. That brass piece there will unscrew and you can pull out the worm gear. Just reinstall that before it gets lost. Let's not cross thread it here. There we go. Now there's something else important you can do. Let's disengage that oscillator and that is to make sure that your blades are balanced and as straight as possible. 
So if I come in here and spin these, and it might be easier to plug it in and turn it on, which is what I'll do. If you watch the blades when they're spinning, you'll be able to see that they make a nice straight line. You won't see a blade wobbling back and forth. Sometimes if these fans fall on the blades, one of these blades or multiple of them will get bent. So if you deem one or find one that you think is correct, then you can match the rest of them to it. So if I turn it on here, you can see that it runs pretty straight and the blades are not wobbling back and forth. Hopefully you can see that in there. It's kind of shiny so it's hard to tell. I'll turn that back off, the slider switch down at the base. And so that just about covers, um, I think, as far as getting everything apart. Now to get down to the switch and start to covering more of the wiring topics, there are three screws on the base that you can remove and this bottom plate, which is covered in green felt, will come off. Sometimes those can rust onto the base so they might need a little persuasion. And something I didn't mention earlier, which I should have, the front cover on the motors can be a little bit tricky to get off. They can be really stiff. Um, it's not good to wedge a screwdriver down in between those gaps and try to pry it apart because you will uh, put marks in the metal and that's not something you want to do. So maybe a little gentle persuasion with a rubber mallet can help you loosen those parts up and pull it off. And then this piece will come straight off the front, straight off that way. So uh, let's get down into the wiring portion of it. This fan has a head wire that comes out of the top. You can see it there on the right and then goes down into the base. This is your main power cord plugging into an outlet. For my wire I use the old school, uh, this is a pulley cord, it's actually a three conductor. The third conductor is not being used, I'm only using two of the conductors in this cable. There it goes, a focused and the old school plug. Just because a cable has three inductors doesn't mean you need to use all three. You can cut off the third one and just use the two that you need here. This is a polarized plug. It's hard to tell, but with this prong here is a little bit fatter than this one. Let's see if we can focus on it there. With the polarized plugs, I believe if I remember correctly, the wider prong is your neutral wire. If so that's what you should consider as your neutral wire is the wider prong, which if your house is wired correctly, that will stand true. However, with regular uh, AC induction motors, it doesn't matter which way you wire it. If you mix up positive and negative, it'll still run the same direction. That's also why old school plugs were never polarized. They just didn't need it. And there's also a safety factor with that as well. When I first turned this fan on, you might have been able to hear a clicking sound. That is the mechanical switch inside, and you can see the spring of it. That when the fan's running at a low RPM, it will engage what I call the starter winding and give the fan more power to be able to get the blades moving. As then, as soon as it speeds up, that clicking stops as that switch opens, and then it's just running off the primary windings of the motor. Something they did back in the day to use less power, I guess. So if I start it up again, you can hear it do that. So if you listen as I start this motor, you should hear that mechanical switch clicking as it turns on. And once it reaches speeds, it shuts off. And I'll turn the fan back off here. So let's open up the base and uh, take a look in the bottom to see how we can wire that switch. This is for an off, high, medium, and low switch. Something to take note of when you're taking the base off, be careful of where the switch is at because you don't want to break that off. This is a Bakelite piece on the end, I believe, or some sort of some sort of plastic composite material. And uh, you don't want to scratch that when you're pulling it out of there because this piece needs to slide through that gap. Alright, so I've got this switch base propped open as just about as far as I can get it without disconnecting any wires. Um, take a look here, this is our main power cord coming in from the outlet. This other end of this is attached to the plug. Comes in the base on the back and comes into here. 
Now with these cloth covered cords, when I cut the fabric on the end, I like to put a little super glue or fray check or something around the end so the fabric doesn't keep fraying and just working its way back up and come unraveled. And if we look here, here are your two points for your main power in. Coming in, the white being considered your positive. If you look, this screw goes all the way through. Does I think it's actually a ceramic piece and you can start to see it connects to the back mechanical parts of the switch if you can see that brass piece in there that is where the switch pivots and so that's where that connection is made now to get this um, switch piece off there are screws that hold it on from the back side of the bottom and to get to those screws I'd have to cut my felt open and that's not something I want to do at this point. Replacing the felt is kind of tricky. There's this split ring that goes around and you have to peel that split ring out. You can remove the old felt, put the new felt in. I had to take away a little bit of metal at the gap in the split ring. You can see it there. That way I had room for the little bit larger felt that's a little bit thicker to fit. that's the idea with how that goes but anyhow back to the switch so we've got your negative side of the switch and positive your positive side to the switch goes to the mechanical part that you actually move down here is the bottom is the knob and I can throw that so there's your mechanical part of the switch and that's what your positive wire goes to while your negative wire just goes to this terminal post your negative wire from the top of the fan, the fan motor, you can see it coming down here, it's the black wire. The way the factory had it ran is that they ran it through the ceramic piece, went down the bottom, and it connects to the opposite side of this terminal. So just where the nut is, the black wire from the motor connects to the nut of this screw on the back side of this ceramic piece and I'll flip it over maybe we can get a little bit of a better view of that down below you can just barely make it out here but there's where your negative wire attaches from the fan motor and if we again if we pull this back open to rotate a little bit there's where your negative wire attaches from your main service and your positive positive wire then goes through the switch we open this up a little bit more try and uh, try not to damage the paint there any more than I already have we have you see these metal nuts they're brass those make up the contacts of the switch and if I remember correct the switch, uh, switch just comes in contact with these screw heads on the bottom side so there's your coil three wires of the coil first one goes there second one goes in the middle and the last wire of your coil coil is also connected to the positive wire that goes up to your motor so hopefully this helps if anybody's got a similar I guess would technically be a four way, four way switch off high medium and low this is how this one's wired for a 1912 Westinghouse electric fan.